we're going to go through the Machiavelli reading now. And um, I will say that this is one of the readings a lot of students enjoy covering because it's much more straightforward than the other readings. Um, Lao Tzu, as m most of you already know, can be a little difficult to follow once you get a handle on what um, the Tao is. It does get a little bit easier to follow. Um, the reading by Plato from the Republic can be a little bit tricky when you're getting the voice of Socrates and trying to determine you know, what exactly did Plato um, believe. With Machiavelli, it's much more straightforward and students tend to like that. Um, but I will tell you, Machiavelli, um, he is with, probably without exception um, the most influential political philosopher that um, the world has ever seen, but he's commonly misunderstood and misrepresented as being somebody who just justifies evil actions or selfish actions. Um, that is a gross misunderstanding of what he writes and his real purpose. And I'll you know, try to show you that by the end of today, or by the end of this video, you'll see that he's got much, a much more nuanced and much more subtle view, um, and he's commonly misrepresented. So if you've heard about him, you've probably heard the phrase, the end justifies the means, as being a Machiavellian phrase. Um, I would say with that phrase, first of all, Machiavelli doesn't have it written in his writing, but I would say um, it's not really a gross misrepresentation to, if you can hold on to that, the end justifies the means, but it's very important to keep in mind the end with Machiavelli is not just selfishness. So the misrepresentation of him is that he's just selfish and um, you know, justifying um, evil actions. Um, and that misses it. So we'll go through it for a bit. <clears throat> and you'll probably see that by the time we get through this. Um, he is writing during the Italian Renaissance, the early part of the Renaissance, um, really in the late 1400s, early 1500s. Um, and it's very important to know this, that Italy was not unified um, at all at this time. In fact, from the time of the fall of the Roman Empire up until the 20th century, um, Italy had not been unified. That's commonly misunderstood. Um, people today think, well, Italy's been a country all the time. Um, no, really, it's been a language. And what you've seen in the Italian uh, region throughout most of its existence is a, uh, a series of city-states. So if you were you know, living in Rome, you called yourself a Roman, not an Italian. You were a Roman speaking Italian. If you were in the north, and you lived in, say, Florence with Machiavelli, you would have called yourself a Florentine, speaking Italian. So he is living in Florence for most of his life. He had a while in exile, and it was a very tumultuous time. Um, Italy was economically and culturally booming at this time. It really was the center of what was going on intellectually and culturally, and also economically in Europe. It, it was far more advanced than most of Europe was. But it was also um, being contended over quite a bit. France and Spain making claims to various parts of it. Um, it was a very contentious time in a very contentious and troubled area. So he's in Florence dealing with all of the changes in politics and regimes and other things. So, um, and at one point in his life he got kicked out of, um, he never was a prince or running a, a principality, but he was connected to the folks in power. At one time he got kicked out, was in exile, a new um, power structure came in. What he did at that time was to write what we now call the prince. The prince was really something of a job application he wrote to the people in power to try to demonstrate that yes, I could be useful to you, I understand politics, you understand politics and need somebody like me who understands politics even better. And so really, the prince was a job application. Um, he never published it in his lifetime. In fact, he didn't even get a job in the new um, uh, power structure in Florence. So, you know, so in a way, the greatest work of political philosophy was a failed job application. It's you know, often seen that way. But he's known for what, uh, how he treats politics and power in a straightforward manner. He tries to strip it down to what it's really about. So he's known for that, and the term you should know with him is pragmatic. He does what's necessary to get things done properly. He tries to consider what people would call the reality of the situation and address what's actually going on 
rather than what we might want to do or what would be best and everything else. He's going to be very practical with what we can get done under these circumstances at these times. So pragmatism is really part of Machiavelli. Not so much ruthlessness, but pragmatism. So the idea that he justifies evil misses the nature of his writing. Okay? Let me go through it for a bit. If you go to um, page 33, and this is in paragraph 4, we'll start it off. Paragraph 4 really quickly, such dominions thus acquired, um, either accustomed to live under a prince or live in freedom, and are acquired either by the arms of the prince himself or of others or else by fortune or by ability. That's just a quick little mark how states are gained. Notice what he does not mention, and he's writing this to a new prince and taking over Florence. What he does not say, which is princes commonly used as part of the rhetoric, was the divine right of kings or of royalty of nobility. In other words, people don't come to power by the hand of God. He's very clear about it. You either took it by force of arms or it was thrust upon you by being the son of a king. That's the way it is. Um, he does not mention divine right of kings. Um, and we'll see this with religion, how he addresses it here. He's very straightforward and pragmatic about it. He's not going to get into any idea that you were blessed and therefore you have an obligation to your people. No. You took it by force of arms or your dad was the king. That's how you got there. Okay? So he does that from the beginning. He, he gets how it is. And then going to the next paragraph, this is, par or I skipped down a bit, paragraph 18, on the same page, it's paragraph 18, and this is a famous line from him. A prince ought to have no other aim or thought, nor select any else, anything else for his study than war and its rules and discipline. For this is the sole art that belongs to him who rules, and is of such force that it not only upholds those who are born princes, but it often enables men to rise from a private station to that rank. So and this is the skill of war. The skill for war is the central um, skill for the prince. And by prince, he does mean anybody who rules, basically. You must have the ability to use war. And he means that in both an intellectual sense, that you must be able to plan and lead and direct your army but he also means it in a sense of you have to be able to fight yourself. You must be able to use the weapons of war. And the important thing is, comes up later in that paragraph, and it's going to come up quite a bit. And this is skipping down a few lines, if you see towards the middle or the bottom. For among other evils, which being unarmed brings you, it causes you to be despised. And this is one of those ignomies against which a prince ought to guard himself as is shown later on, because there is nothing proportionate between the armed and the unarmed, and it is not reasonable that he who is armed should yield obedience willingly to him who is unarmed, or that the unarmed man should be secure among armed servants. This brings up a very important aspect of Machiavelli and part of what makes him a conservative. The hierarchy that arms establish are absolutely necessary for maintaining power. If you are going to establish and maintain a position of power, you must be practiced and knowledgeable in the art of war. Because if you are not, people who are will not respect you. They will have contempt for you, and they will not follow you. If they obey you today, they will not obey you for long, because there's no reason for them to keep doing that. So, with him, and this is one of the few sections where he sees it as you must know it in and of itself and there's no artificiality to this. He's very clear you must know this inside and out and you must know it in a very real way because it has a very real um, effect of creating a hierarchy and maintaining it. If you're the prince and you're going to be above other people, you do that by establishing your prowess in war. So the hierarchy is maintained through respect, through respect for your ability and for your skills in war. The hierarchy is necessary and it's something he shared with Plato. Okay? Jump up a few uh, page or so, up to page 35, and if you go up to paragraph 21, paragraph 21, and he gets into the nature of why people are praised and blamed in this section. 
It remains now to see what ought to be the rules of conduct for a prince towards subject should be subjects, subjects and friends. And as I know that many have written on this point, I expect I shall be considered presumptuous in mentioning it again, um, especially as is dis I'm discussing and I shall depart from the methods of other people. So what Machiavelli is making it clear, when he discusses politics and power, he's going to do this differently. Watch what he does with the next sentence. But it being my intention to write a thing which shall be useful to him who apprehends it, it appears to me more appropriate to follow up with the real truth of the matter than the imagination of it. For many have pictured republics and principalities which in fact have never been known or seen because how one lives is so far distant from how one ought to live that he who neglects what is done um, for what ought to be done sooner affects his ruin than his preservation. For a man who wishes to act entirely up to his professions of virtue soon meets what destroys him among so much that is evil. He is referring to Plato's Republic, um, to exactly the type of situation that you just read about in the allegory of the cave. And he's very clear that this doesn't exist. It doesn't exist and it's never existed. And I'm not writing for people who want it to exist. I'm writing for people in a real world situation who want to know how to run an actual republic or a principality. So that's the pragmatism that Machiavelli is about. And what he also starts to bring up is the fact that you're not going to be surrounded by good and by virtue. And what you profess, and if you try to live by what you profess, you will be ruined by others who don't even bother professing it. They might profess it, but they'll act differently. So the world is very different than the virtuous and wise world that Socrates tried to promote in the Republic. That's exactly what um, Machiavelli is putting forward here. Machiavelli, I should mention, was something of a classic scholar, um, and especially a scholar of the Roman Empire, but he certainly had read the, um, the Republic of um, Plato in other works, so he understood it, and he wants to make it clear he's going to be the pragmatist and write about actual politics and power and not about how things ought to be, about how we think we would like to be. That's nice. He has nothing against virtue and other things, but he doesn't want to see somebody in power acting according to what they profess. Okay? Jump over, if you will, up to the next page. Um, and this is paragraph 23 on page 36. Paragraph 23. Commencing then with the first of the above-named characteristics, I say that it would be well to be reputed liberal. Nevertheless, reputed or liberality exercise in a way that does not bring you the reputation for it, injures you. For if one exercises it honestly, and as it should be exercised, it may not become known, and you will not avoid the reproach of the opposite. This is a very important turn in Machiavelli. When he's dealing with skills for war, he means exactly that. Learn it and demonstrate it. What you demonstrate is what you know and people will respect you for it. With, when he comes to liberality, and by this I want to be clear, um, please avoid confusing this with today's terminology of liberal and conservative. He's using liberality in the sense of giving things away, giving things to the people, and spending the state resources. Um, he says to be seen as liberal is good, but if you act according to it, you're going to wreck the state. That's what you're going to do. But behave miserly. And this is a very important turn in Machiavelli because he starts talking about put up a screen of one thing, but behave in an entirely different manner. This gets into the images that are needed to maintain power in politics. You must put up the image of liberality if people are going to like you but you must behave in a miserly manner if you're going to avoid taking money away from people. In other words, if you keep giving away the state's resources, you're going to eventually have to tax people. So instead, behave in a miserly manner, but make a big show of giving things away. Be known as liberal, but don't behave that way. So there's an image that he wants you to foster 
you have to put forward an image. That ability to foster an image is absolutely necessary to maintaining the state. Absolutely necessary to maintain it. Because a miserly um, leader is eventually going to start to be despised. He must put forward the image of being liberal. Okay? Um, jump up to paragraph 24. Therefore, a prince, not being able to exercise this virtue of liberality in such a way that it is recognized, except to his cost, if he be wise, he ought to not fear the reputation of being mean. For in time he, he will come to be more considered than if liberal, seeing that with his economy, his revenues are enough that he can defend himself against all attacks and is able to engage in enterprises without burdening his people. Thus it comes to pass that, it, that he exercises liberality towards all from whom he does not take, who are numberless in mean, uh, meanness towards those whom he does not give, who are few. In other words, if you actually practice this miserliness or this meanness, you're doing something good for everybody. You're doing something good for everybody. If you actually behave in a more liberal manner of giving things away, you're actually doing harm to everybody and doing something good for only a few. Because you can't be liberal with everybody. You can only be liberal with partial part of the state. And this is very important. And this is a part that's often missed in Machiavelli because keep in mind he's actually trying to improve the nature of leadership within the principalities. This is about being functional and making a better life for the people living under the prince. Not just about keeping the prince in power just for the sake of keeping the prince in power. That's not the end game. That's not the end game of Machiavelli. Machiavelli is going towards something better, in other words, a more effective state, one that functions better. Okay? That's his end game. Um, jump up, if you could, to the bottom of 37, um, uh, paragraph 27, and there is nothing wastes so rapidly as liberality, for even whilst you exercise it, you lose the power to do so, and to so become either poor or despised, or else in avoiding poverty, rapacious and hated. Once you become hated, the people start looking down upon you and you are now threatened. So maintaining power properly, not just maintaining power, but maintaining power properly keeps the hierarchy stable. Once you're hated, people see nothing to lose in rebelling against you. So you avoid being hated. You avoid being despised by um, exercising the art of war. You avoid being hated by behaving in a miserly manner, but appearing to be liberal. Okay? Jump up if you could um, to the next paragraph, paragraph 28. And I'm going to go into the middle of that paragraph. This is paragraph 28, right in the middle. Therefore a prince, and this is a fairly famous quotation, so long as he keeps his subjects united and loyal, ought not to mind the reproach of cruelty, because with few examples he will be more merciful than those who, though um, too much, uh, through too much mercy, allow disorders to arise, from which follow murders or robberies. For these are wont to injure the whole people, whilst those executions which originate with the prince offend the individual only. For the modern um, sensibility, this is actually a bit shocking. But watch what he's doing with it. He's making it very clear that you can show absolute cruelty to an individual if it maintains order in the state. And the odd thing is, he does not mention at all the idea of individual justice. There isn't a right to a trial or anything else. Individual justice isn't important. Do try to get the guilty person but make a show of your cruelty if they will fear you. Fear is not hatred. Okay? Fear is not hatred. It's different. People who fear the leader will not revolt against the leader. In fact, what it creates for Machiavelli, the end game, is a more peaceful state. That more peaceful state allows people to live better lives. Once again, notice it's not just about maintaining the prince for the sake of maintaining the prince. It's about creating a more peaceful state. That is Machiavelli's endgame. 
A peaceful state where people don't go after each other. A peaceful state where people respect the laws and respect the prince. A properly functioning hierarchy will establish that peaceful state for the good of all the people. The common misconception leaves that out of a Machiavelli um, explanation. So you should seen, be seen as merciful, that's great, but have no um, compunction about using cruelty if you need to use it to um, establish order. So you can use cruelty, but you should come across, be seen as um, basically being merciful. That's going back to the image that he's trying to create. You create an image of being liberal and merciful, but have no problem with behaving miserly or cruel when you need to. With being miserly is pretty much all the time. With cruelty, it must be short, sharp, and effective. Create an image. Create fear that they won't mess with you. Individuals will not. Okay? Um, jump up a bit if you could. Jump over to page um, 39. Um, this is a very, very famous, I'm going to end it on this with paragraph 30, a very famous quotation. Um, <clears throat> paragraph 30. Upon this question arises whether it is better to be loved than feared, or feared than loved. This is probably one of the most famous passages in Machiavelli. It may be answered that one should wish to be both, but because it is difficult to unite them in one person, it is much safer to be feared than loved. When of the two, either must be dispensed with, because this is them to be asserted in general of men, that they are ungrateful, fickle, false, cowardly, covetous, and as long as you succeed, they are yours entirely. They will offer you their blood, property, life, children, and um, as said above, when the need is far distant, but when it approaches, they turn against you. That is Machiavelli's statement on human nature. People cannot be trusted. They are not rational. They cannot be depended upon. They are often prone to violence and disorder. That is a statement on human nature. Everything else that is presented follows from that. That is why Machiavelli is considered to be the example of a conservative political philosophy. Take care.